uh, his role in relation to the uh, Murrundi Range. It's a, a much needed piece of infrastructure Order that is finally being, being 2 p.m. The debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 97. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. The member for New England will have leave to continue speaking when the debate is resumed. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. And I refer the Prime Minister to his claim that he can repay the nation's $315 billion debt by 2022. I also refer to the statements from the Treasurer's office last night, confirming that, contrary to what was said in the House yesterday, these claims are not supported by the budget papers, but rather by Treasury modelling. Will the Prime Minister now release the Treasury modelling? Or are Australian taxpayers just to be left with a debt repayment promise that does not add up? The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question, because uh, the government's strategy for returning the uh, budget to surplus and for repaying um, the government borrowing is outlined clearly in the budget papers. Furthermore, what I'd say to the Leader of the Opposition, as his question goes to the point of numbers, is as follows. We had um, the clear articulation of the opposition strategy on debt and deficit on display at the doors today. Uh, when the Leader of the Opposition was asked the following question, given we're all about specificity on budget numbers, he was asked this question. What does the Coalition regard as an acceptable level of debt? Answer from Mr Turnbull. Well, the level of debt should be no more than is absolutely necessary. <laughs> then the journalist asked this question. What's that then? Answer, Mr Turnbull. Well, it's not a question of a number. Unquote. And so we've had a two-week strategy here, uh, uh, a, a two-week strategy on the part of the opposition, which is all about numbers and specificity and drilling down. And then when asked a simple question on the doors today, come on, Malcolm, what is it? The answer is, well, it's not a question of a number. Can I just say? <laughs> This is the ultimate bookending of what began with the hockey doctrine two weeks ago, which confirmed that the Liberal strategy on deficit and debt is equal to the government strategy on deficit and debt. Equal, oh, $25 billion less, they say, and then they refuse to back $22 billion worth of savings. So Joe's position is a $275 billion Liberal deficit and debt strategy, add $22 billion worth of savings foregone. That equals a $300 billion debt and deficit strategy. That's the hockey doctrine two weeks ago. The Turnbull doctrine the, the, today says it's not about a specific number. Is it any wonder that nobody actually attaches any credibility whatsoever to this scare campaign, this scare campaign on debt and deficit? It has one single objective in mind, the government building the economy up, the Liberals seeking to talk the economy down. The member for Page. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, how is the Australian government building out of recession through its Nation Building for Recovery program? The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for Page for her question. And I note that under the Australian government's Nation Building for Recovery plan, there are over 157 projects underway in the members' electorate. 157, and there will be an investment of $43.8 million in the members' electorate. 121 projects under the largest school modernisation program in Australia's history. 20 social housing units being built in the members' electorate. 16 projects under the government's Black Spots and Boomgates program, including $950,000 towards the accident-prone area of the Kyogle Road at Lismore, and $10.9 billion for five local councils under the Community Infrastructure Program, including a $3.4 million investment in the Evans Head Aquatic Centre. These are practical projects aimed to build the infrastructure her community needs for tomorrow while supporting jobs and business and apprenticeships today. That's the government's uh, overall strategy in response to the global economic recession, which is ripping the heart out of economies across the world. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to confirm today to the House 
that the government, through its strategy, is providing funding for infrastructure for every one of Australia's 9,540 schools. Every one of them. And I'd like to confirm to the House that under the National School Pride Program, that we will be delivering $1.3 billion to 9,490 schools for 13,176 projects. I'd also confirm to the House works on 8,863 projects at 5,994 schools are due to commence this month. And on top of that, on 7 May, the government has allocated $2.8 billion of funding to, 2010 major, to 2010 major projects like school halls, gymnasiums, multipurpose centres across nearly 1,500 Australian primary schools. Mr Speaker, that is the government's strategy on nation building. Yesterday we had some interesting exchanges with those opposite on their response to nation building in their electorate. And I would draw our attention, the attention of the House to one of our favourite members opposite, the member for Canning, a person given to enormous generosity of spirit. And he said at the time when this stimulus package supporting these projects was put through the House, this is what the member for Canning had to say, quote, I am saying tonight, as the Leader of the Opposition has said, that he, we will not be a part of this, unquote. That's what the member for Canning said in February. What did the member for Canning have to say last night? And I quote him, I support whatever taxpayer funds or funds borrowed on behalf of taxpayers are going into my electorate, unquote. <laughs> what a distance it is. Order, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister resume his seat. Order, those on my right. The member for Canning. Mr. Speaker, for the Prime Minister to be relevant, he must be accurate. And Order, the member for Canning will resume his seat. Was, the member for Canning will resume his seat. The member for Canning will resume his seat. The Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, how they squirm and turn when presented with the facts. A bit like the member for Fatten yesterday. Will I? Won't I? Put my hand up. Put it half up. Put it down. What day is it? Are they watching back home? Are they watching on TV? Are they listening through the broadcast? It's called being transparent and honest with your community. You either vote for it or you don't. And those opposite, and those opposite know nothing whatsoever about transparency. Order. Let's go. Let's go. I always Order. love Joe's interventions. It's called the, the Joe Hockey Bellow Factor. The louder you bellow, the, you know the less the amount of content Order. lying Never behind the bellowing. Let's go to uh, our good friend opposite. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pass by the member for Patton. He made a um, he made a notable contribution to the House yesterday as well on this. And, uh, Order. and let's go to the member for Wentworth, who we know, as the leader of the opposition, has a keen interest in local infrastructure as well. Because we know, when the minister for infrastructure showed up to announce an investment in the Waverley Park Pavilion, uh, the leader of the opposition had the following to say: "Quote." Could I just say that I'm delighted by the government spending this money on the pavilion here? Delighted. I'm delighted to be here to welcome the investment. It's a very good investment in infrastructure. I have a few problems with this. How does that reconcile itself with the huff and puff and bluster we have heard here for the last two weeks? But I could also go on to the question of schools in the honourable member's electorate. And uh, let's just look at a few of these schools. Uh, we've got um, St Anthony's School. Does the Leader of the Opposition support the refurbishment of the playground and classrooms and the installation of broadband Order. at St Anthony's School and his electorate? Order. Prime Minister, she's... Prime Minister. Uh, does he support the refurbishment of classrooms and roofing at St Clare's College in Waverley? Order. The member for Canning. What about that one? <laughs> Order. The order. The Prime Minister resume his seat. Order, order. The leader of the, pro of the opposition on a point of order. Speaker, we have raised before this business of the Prime Minister posing questions to the opposition. Now, if he wants us to do that, if he wants us to respond to the way he's using billions of borrowed order. money the to blackmail members of the opposition, will resume Parliament, his seat. The leader of the opposition will resume his seat. The leader of the opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition is warned.
order. The rhetorical, the, the use of these rhetorical questions highlights a need for the House to consider those. No. The need to consider the amount of debate that is allowed in, in the answers to questions, because I remind honourable members that a lot of the angst that's expressed is that the standing orders have several, several restrictions on questions, and those restrictions do not apply to answers. The Manager of Opposition Business, Speaker, I assume, I... on a point of order. Yes, Mr Speaker. I direct you to Standing Order 98B, which is a very specific standing order, which says during question time a member may orally ask a question of a minister, but not a parliamentary secretary, without notice and for immediate response. The contrary for to the comments you've made to the House, Sturt. the, the standing orders Sturt are very— will resume his seat. The member for Sturt will resume his seat. I thank him for supporting my case. <laughs> the member for Sturt will resume his seat. The member for Sturt will resume his seat. Prime Minister, in response to the question. You have another party room meeting or something. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Standing order 86, Mr. Speaker, I'm entitled to take a point of order. The point of order that I'm taking is that indeed you pointed to the standing orders as inhibiting your capacity to make the Prime Minister conform with the standing orders. Standing order 98 specifically the prohibits the member for being Sturt asked resume his seat. The, the member for Sturt will resume his seat. Again, I thank him for supporting the point that I'm making. Because it is any, there is no way then that the Leader of the Opposition can get up to answer a question. Because there is no question. There is no question. The Prime Minister is responding to the question. The Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. The degree of discomfort on the part of those opposite is transparent to the nation. Uh, of course, we then come to the question of the Galilee Catholic Primary School, um, and we'd be interested to know uh, whether the honourable member supports Order. the refurbishment the Prime or has reconstruction made his point. of the covered learning area at that school. No, the Prime Thank Minister you. has to call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Or the upgrading of floors, roofs, and sewerage at the Wallara Public School. Yeah, looks like a nice school, but I'm sure they could deal with the upgrading of the floors and roofs. The roof Prime and Minister resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I refer to your own ruling of this week in which you said that props should be incidental to an answer, and, you, and for, for a few, uh, previous speakers' rulings, Speaker Andrew and Speaker Jenkins Senior, on numerous occasions, that in fact uh, uh, props were out of order or were not to be encouraged. The, the bulk of the Prime Minister's answer is waving embarrassingly pathetic photographs around, and I ask you to rule them out of order, otherwise props will become the major aspect of answers and questions, which I'm sure you don't want to happen. Mr. Order. It is true that if one reads practice—I'm not sure about the generational reference, but I'll, I, I will check that. It probably will have me amused over the over the holidays, the, uh, over the weekend. The practice, practice refers that the use of props is tolerated but not encouraged. That's, that's correct. And I read a, a ruling from last parliament in, into the record again yesterday, and there are several similar rulings. I did make a point also that all this is, illustrates to me that Yet again, something that we could move to that could be approached with maturity, perhaps we may not be able to do. I remind honourable members on my left that when the member for North Sydney decided to take an action that would 
give his question more vibrancy. That was allowed. That was allowed. And at least one media agency actually gave him the outcome that I assume that he was after. The Prime Minister. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I noticed one of the interventions on the part of those opposite referred to uh, embarrassment. Can I just say that what is singularly embarrassing for those officers having to stand before their local communities and say that they have voted against each one of these investments in their local schools? That is why they are embarrassed, except, except the good old member for Canning who did this complete backflip with reverse pike and twist yesterday in the parliament. So whether it is the uh, the uh, Kincopal Rose Bay School of the Sacred Heart, Multipopus Hall and Performing Arts Centre, to show that our program is directed to non-government schools as well, uh, St Francis of Assisi School as well, uh, on top of that St Catherine School, and then we have the installation of wireless uh, broadband at St Charles Catholic Primary School, very nice school as well. So those opposite have said, those opposite have said that um, uh, these are questions which have been posed to them and they say have been imposed uh, posed to them in a manner inconsistent the with the standing Baden. orders. Can I just say the to member those for officers? Dixon. Can I just say to those officers? Member for Dixon. What <laughs> has the order the leader of the opposition? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, no, sorry, the leader of the opposition. I've just got some. No. Very good. Thinking time, I hope. <laughs> I inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon the Minister for Planning Investment of the Lao People's Democratic Republic, Dr Sin Lavong Kutpotun. On behalf of the House, I extend to him a very warm welcome. Yindi Ton Lap. The, I, I was unsure that you, whether the Prime Minister had finished or not, but if the Prime Minister hasn't finished, um, he will now come to his conclusion, but the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will. So, the uh, leader of the opposition uh, on the, the uh, question of the investment in these schools, these very good schools in his electorate, uh, has uh, disputed. Yeah, look, I, if the manager of opposition business will resume his seat, I, I think that I created some confusion. I'm not sure how, but I, I was going to ask the Prime Minister whether he had concluded or not before making the. Uh, greeting that I did. Um, the Prime Minister, I think, uh, had anticipated one of your uh, prov provocative type of, or, um, I think, not provocative, there's a word that you used last, last week about one of your points of order, and he was in anticipation and may have sat down. So, well, helpful will do. The, the Prime Minister in conclusion. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Speaker, and it's uh, glad to have our good our good friend Tony Abbott intervening so volubly as well, because I know he stands up for investment in his electorate as well. Mr Speaker, uh, the, um, and of course a strong upholder of parliamentary standards himself, uh, can I say, Mr Speaker, that um, the Leader of the Opposition has objected to a series of questions being posed to him uh, about whether he supports investments in each of these schools. Well, he could use, he could use the device, and I challenge him to use the device used yesterday by our good friend, the member for Canning, who stood up and said in this place he supported the investment in his electorate, he supported the borrowing to support the investment in his electorate, in the schools and the schools which were funded as a consequence of that investment and borrowing. So the procedures of the House have that facility available, Mr Speaker, for the Leader of the Opposition to stand up at the conclusion of question time and say that on each of these schools that I have represented, does he support the investment in those schools and the borrowing to underpin the investment in those schools, or does he not? That is his challenge, pure and simple. The Leader, the leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. And I remind the Prime Minister that in life there are only two certainties, it is said, death and taxes. And I ask, given today's revelations, Order. that this government's reckless cash splash Order. has resulted in $14 million in cheques being sent out to the dead, isn't the Prime Minister reminding the Australian people of a third certainty, that Labor can never be trusted with taxpayers' money? The Prime Minister. Uh, first of all, Mr Speaker, can I say to the honourable gentleman who has asked the question uh, that the criteria for the 
uh, administration of the payment concerned goes to the completion of a tax return in the year which has been specified, which is 0708. Furthermore, as the honourable member would know, when the previous government, and the member for Higgins, uh, would be fully familiar with this himself, uh, that when the previous government uh, implemented low-income tax offset bonuses, they implied exactly the same methodology as been employed by the government in relation to this matter as well. Therefore, I would suggest to those opposite that they reflect carefully upon the standards they bring to bear in this debate. Can I say also, Mr Speaker, to the honourable gentleman as he asks this question, to be exceptionally mindful of the circumstances of those who have lost loved ones in the last 12 months. This is a sensitive matter. This is a um, the honourable leader Order. of the opposition interjects Order. on this point. I would simply say to those opposite. Order. I would say to those opposite that for those who have lost loved ones in the last 12 months, this is not an incidental matter. Order. It is of direct and personal concern to them, and I would urge those opposite to reflect on that as they pursue this particular line of questioning. The member for Macon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline for the House the importance of stimulating the economy through direct investment in infrastructure so we can support jobs in local communities? The Treasurer. So I uh, thank the Honourable Member for Macon for his question because there are something like 107 projects underway in Macon, something like 102 school projects uh, in Macon. Of course, they are supporting jobs and they are supporting small business in Adelaide, and they are key parts of our nation building plan for recovery. But of course, not one, not one of those 107 projects would go ahead if those opposite were in government. Not one. And these vital jobs, this vital support for business would not be there. And the consequence for those local communities is higher unemployment and more business failures. It's really that simple. And of course that is why those opposite are so embarrassed about the fact that they don't have an alternative fiscal policy, which is why we are getting this scare campaign on deficit and debt. Now, Mr Speaker, we have put in place through the budget an historic investment in essential infrastructure, road, rail, port, to expand the productive capacity of our nation. And of course, something like 70 per cent of our stimulus is invested in infrastructure, which of course is being opposed by the opposition here, but it is vital in supporting jobs today. You know, without the government's investment, up to 210,000 Australians would be out of work. We should think about that for a moment. That is the logical consequence of their position. Now, they're our, fe they're our fellow Australians, they're our neighbours, they're our family members, they're our, they are our workmates. And those opposite should seriously consider the unsustainability of their position in this House, as has been demonstrated day after day by the Prime Minister and other ministers, because this stimulus through investment and in infrastructure is absolutely vital to support jobs. But I suspect there's only one job that the Leader of the Opposition is worried about here, and that is his. Only one job. Well, it is the truth. It is the truth. The only job he's worried about is his own job. He's not worried about the jobs of Australians because he doesn't walk in the same shopping aisles as average Australians. Mr. Speaker, he certainly Order. doesn't do that. Because why does he vote Order. against stimulus, Mr. Speaker? Why does he vote against stimulus? If he understood the impact, those if he understood the impact of his decisions to oppose these measures, why does he vote against the stimulus? For Mount Creek. Because he is chronically, chronically out of touch, chronically out of touch with the needs of the Australian economy, and chronically out of touch with the need to support jobs in our community, Mr Speaker, because the only job he is worried about is his own, is his own naked political opportunism, Mr Speaker. That's what rules the day. Well, we on this side of the House will go on supporting jobs, Order Mr the Speaker, member for Dixon. doing the responsible thing by the Australian economy, the member for while Dixon. those opposite 
do the opportunist the thing, Dixon's Mr. Speaker. Born. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to the reason he gave at a press conference this week for personally blocking the appointment of Mr Hugh Borriman as ambassador to Germany. And I quote the Prime Minister's words. When it comes to foreign diplomatic appointments, I do place priority on languages. And last time I looked at Germany, they speak German. <laughs> Given that the Foreign Minister had Order. boasted in a media release only a few days earlier of Mr Borman's German language qualifications, <laughs> will the Prime Minister now give the real reason that he Order. personally vetoed the appointment of this highly respected senior diplomat as Australia's ambassador to Germany. The Prime Minister. What, um, Mr. Speaker, one of the delights oh, the about the Biden. member for Curtin is originality. Uh, one of the further delights about the member for Curtin is spontaneity. And uh, the one thing about the member for Curtin is that you just need to turn into the pages of the Australian today to work out that you're going to get a question from the member for Curtin, because it says so that she's going to ask a question on this subject today. Can you picture that 40-member uh, tactics committee of the Liberal Party? Monday, Order. Billy goes in. Can I have a question? No. Tuesday, can I have a question? No. Wednesday, can I have a question? No. Thursday, it's in the newspapers. The I should Treasurer, be given a question. The Prime Minister will return his seat. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. 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 The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has... Order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Mr Speaker, this is a serious matter about the Prime Minister personally interfering in the career prospects Sorry. of a highly respected Australian diplomat. I ask seat. him to The Deputy Leader of the Rep Opposition will resume his seat. The, Treasurer, the Prime Minister will respond to the question. Uh, one thing uh, almost as enjoyable about one of Julie's angry looks, it's one of Alex's angry Order. looks, the Prime when Minister Alex used to be in the to House, and we miss titles. Alex. The Prime Minister resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, if the Prime Minister has had so much time to prepare, why doesn't he answer order the question? The <laughs> it's not a point of order. The Prime Minister will refer to members by their titles. The Prime Minister will respond to the question. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And, uh, referring briefly to the uh, former Foreign Minister, Mr Downer, and uh, the currently the Opposition's Chief of Staff would be entirely familiar with this, about how the former Foreign Minister dealt with ambassadors in Argentina and elsewhere when they happened to cross the paths of the then Foreign Minister, but I'm sure they could answer for that on their right, own the account. Prime Minister Mr. will respond Speaker, to the question. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Prime Minister will respond to the question. The... The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat until the House comes to order, predominantly on her side. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister made a public statement about why he interfered Order. with the, the diplomat's Deputy Leader appointment. Of the opposition, that statement the was of the not true. Is raising on I asked that the Prime the Minister now the give the real reason why seat. he The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume her seat. Prime Minister will respond to the question. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, consistent um, with um, uh, practice, which I understand was probably the case with uh, Mr. Downer and Mr. Howard, uh, the Foreign Minister, uh, Mr. Order. the Foreign Minister, Order. and I regularly discuss senior diplomatic appointments. Order. The Foreign Minister and I agree on appointments which go to the question of which skills are best applied to which of our most senior diplomatic appointments abroad. Order. That applied in the case of the posting, which is the subject to this question as well. Member on the question of uh, Mr. Hugh Borman. He is a first-class diplomat. The Kingdom of Sweden is an important country for Australia. They will soon, as I am advised, assume the presidency of the European Union. Uh, we therefore wish him well on that appointment. He will do an excellent job. Furthermore, Mr Speaker, could I say Order. applying those national interests 
criteria to appointments was exactly the discussion the Foreign Minister I had, and I had in relation to the appointment of Mr Tim Fisher as Australia's first ambassador to the Holy See. The, mem the member for O'Connor on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I oh, see the, mem no, the member for O'Connor will resume his seat until the and the member for Braddon will resume his seat. Oh, but yet again, the member for New England is not helping me with a certain matter. The member for O'Connor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I seek leave to table letters from the Attorney General, which includes a, a shell press release in my name, which is now obviously on the Prime Minister's behaviour an invitation to entrapment. Is, is leave granted? Leave is not yeah. granted. The member for Braddon. Always... The member for Braddon. The member for Braddon. Member for Braddon. Yeah, thank you. The member for Braddon has the call. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, leave is not my... granted. <laughs> the member for Braddon will hear me say. No, I'm not. The member for Braddon. Uh, someone's going out in a box. My question is to the Minister for Education, Employment and Workplace Relations and Social Inclusion. Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House on what the government is doing to invest in education infrastructure and of the reaction from local members to this investment? The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Braddon for his question and for his uh, bringing of decorum into the House. Uh, the member for Braddon, of course, Order. would be welcoming the 75 projects in his electorate the under the Building the Education Revolution program. I know he is a member who cares very passionately about the state of his local schools and also about supporting jobs in his electorate and would be welcoming those 75 projects under the Building the Education Revolution, which are part of the 93 projects in total in his electorate worth $35.3 million. And of course, these projects are just some of the more than 15,000 projects that have been approved through the opening rounds of the National School Pride program and the Primary Schools for the 21st Century program. Now, of course, the great unknown about these programs is not which schools have benefited so far, but whether or not the Leader of the Opposition supports this expenditure on these schools, a question I hope he clarifies after question time. And when he is clarifying that question, he may, during the course of question time, want to look into the galleries above us where we are expecting, during the course of question time and in the House today, to see the Sacred Hearts Primary School from the member for McKellar's electorate, Pimble Ladies College from the member for Bradfield's electorate, Greenpoint Christian College from the member for Robertson's electorate, St Gertrude's Primary School from the member for Prospect's electorate, and Hornsby Heights Public School from the member for Barara's electorate. And I would also ask the Leader of the Opposition, as he contemplates uh, whether or not he should say he supports this expenditure, that these schools have received assistance from our National School Pride program for things like the refurbishment of classrooms and school grounds, the construction of new shade structures and general refurbishment. And I note that individually some of these schools have benefited already under our primary schools for the 21st century program, with $2 million going to the Hornsby Heights Public School, $3 million to the Greenpoint Christian College and $2.5 million going to the Sacred Hearts Primary School. Now, Mr Speaker, this is important national expenditure about the future of our schools and about supporting jobs today. It's expenditure that every member of the opposition voted against. It was consequently with some surprise, Mr Speaker, that I read a media release put out by the member for Bowman on 12 May, where he says, having come into this House and voted against this expenditure, and I quote, 11 Redland schools will receive major building grants worth a total of more than $26 million, Federal Member Andrew Lamming announced today. 
and goes on. I am a strong supporter of any investment Order. in educational infrastructure Order. like language and science laboratories. So he's a supporter of any investment in educational infrastructure when he's putting out a media release in his electorate. What he can't do is bring himself into the parliament and vote for it when it's under consideration by this House. Now, I know, of course, that the surname of the member for Bowen is Lamming, but of course I think the behaviour by those opposite would be better caught under the word lemming. Lemmings are, of course, rodents famous for throwing themselves over cliffs in, in uh, herds. Order. The Deputy Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member for McCullough on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Under the standing orders, Mr. Speaker, you are required to keep order in this house, and, and the actions of the Deputy Prime Minister and using demeaning language uh, against a member in this house is also precluded by the standing orders, and she should be made to apologise and withdraw. It is order. highly unseemly and brings order. nothing but dishonour the on her. Member herself. for McCullough will resume her seat. Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and there's nothing like getting lectured by the party of Wilson Tucky Order. on parliamentary standards. But of course, Mr Speaker, you would be aware of the uh, myth of the lemming, and to quote the ABC Science website, uh, the, this myth is now a metaphor. Order the Deputy Prime Minister resume his seat. The member for McCullough on a point of order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Again, under the standing orders, when, a standing or when somebody draws a point of order, it is required to be ruled upon. Yes, I would so ask you to rule upon my point of order. The member for McCullough resume has said I ruled on the point of order by giving the call to the Deputy Prime Minister. The Deputy Prime Minister. <laughs> Tell him, where'd you miss and, the mark? and as the website says, the quote, Minister this Trade. myth is now a metaphor for the behaviour of crowds of people who foolishly follow each other, lemming-like, regardless of the consequences. Well, who does that remind you of, Mr Speaker? I think Order. the lemming-like Liberal Party of Australia. The member for North Sydney. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. And Mr Speaker, my question Order. is to the Treasurer. Order. And Mr Speaker, uh, I remind the House that the last time the Labor Party had a debt, it took the Coalition to pay it off. And now the Labor Party has an even bigger debt, <laughs> Mr Speaker, uh, which is going out, Mr Speaker, all the way, Mr Speaker. Member for North Sydney, resume his seat. Mr Speaker. The member for North Sydney, resume his seat. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The member for Blair. Uh, the member for Blair has the call. The member for Blair has the call. Right. The member for Blair has the call. The member for Blair has the call. The member for Blair has the call. My my question is to the minister. Member for Blair, resume his seat. The member for Sturt. Mr Speaker, this is a very serious point of order. You have, uh, over successive days, allowed the Prime Minister to wave posters around in this place, which we have pointed out to you on numerous occasions is provoking the opposition. You are now apparently, if I'm correct, you are apparently ruling out yep. a question the from for the Sturt Shadow Treasurer. Seat. Member for Sturt will resume his seat. The member for Sturt will resume his seat. Now, hop up and do your stunt. The member for Sturt, because I am ruling it, I am ruling it out of order. No, no. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. Because having just suggested that the actions that the member for North Sydney took yesterday were appropriate in, a, in, in, in inviting other members 
to have to assist him with a prop is is a blatant is a blatant On yesterday's occasion, if you are suggesting that the passing of the papers that were to be tabled is akin to what you just did, I'm surprised. The member for North Sydney. So speaker, I, uh, I respectfully suggest to you, Mr Speaker, that I am using this prop to illustrate the matter that goes to the substance of my no, question the member about North, the government's The debt. member for North Sydney will resume his seat. I'm about to explain to you, member for McEwen. <laughs> if, in fact, if, in fact, if we took each of those uh, frames individually, there would have been no complaint. The member for Blair will resume his seat one at a time. Separate him. The North, I'll give him the call next while you prepare. No, well, come on. I mean, we're not running a sideshow. The member for Sturt on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I think the uh, ludicrousness of the situation has been amply demonstrated and I respectfully ask you to give the member for North Sydney the call to ask his question. The member for North Sydney will come to his question now or he will lose the question. The well, member Mr. for Speaker, North Sydney. My question refers I refer the Treasurer to the fact that the last member time for the North Labor Sydney Party will resume his seat. The Chief Government Whip. Mr Speaker, with great respect, you gave the call to the, to the member for Blair. His call has been interrupted by a number of points of order, but he actually still had the call. The member for North Sydney has the call. <coughs> Mr Speaker, I refer to the fact that the last time the Labor Party was in government, the Coalition uh, had to pay off their debt after they left Australia with a burden of $96 billion. This time the Labor Party is in government again, and the Labor Party is accruing debt on a massive scale as the biggest spending government in modern Australian history. And the debt is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and redder and redder, just like the Deputy Prime Minister's face. Speaker. And I say to the Treasurer, Order. now that the Minister for Finance said simple mathematics explains how to pay off all of this Labor Party debt. Will you now come clean with the Australian people about just how much debt you are really leaving Australians? The Treasurer. Well, Mr. The Speaker, member for Fadden is warned. Mr. Speaker, Treasurer. they can never get fired up about jobs in local communities. They can never get fired up about the people that are being pushed against a global recession. But what member we just for saw was the hockey $300 billion debt. That's what we saw. He has admitted, and so has the Leader of the Opposition, admitted in the circumstances this country fires, uh, finds itself 
that they would have to borrow as much as the government has to borrow, and they would not pay it off one day sooner. That's what they've confirmed. Because if they're not confirming that, where is their alternative plan? Where is their alternative plan? What is the alternative fiscal policy? Oh, that's I remind their the leader policy. of the opposition to be status. A blank piece of paper, Mr. Speaker. A blank piece of paper. No alternative fiscal policy because they know, they know that this government has had forced upon it, and this country has had forced upon it, a $210 billion revenue collapse. A $210 billion revenue collapse. And if they were going to do something different, what they would have to do is savagely increase taxes or savagely cut back services. And they come into this House and won't nominate one saving they could make. And what that means is that they would borrow every cent the government has borrowed and they would not pay it back one day sooner. They are complete frauds. The member for Blair. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Finance and Deregulation. Why is it vital for the government to invest in nation building infrastructure? Why is it crucial that the importance of infrastructure investment is emphasised in debate about Australia's economy? The Minister for Finance and Deregulation. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Blair for his question. I notice that the, there are 392 projects underway in the member's electorate, projects supporting jobs and small businesses as part of the government's Nation Building for Recovery plan, the plan that is committed to building Australia for the future and which the opposition continues to vigorously resist, carping negatively about Australia's economic prospects. Mr Speaker, the government has a long-term strategy as well as a short-term strategy of stimulating activity in the economy. It also has a long-term strategy to return Australia to a strong productivity growth pathway. And there are three central elements to this strategy, investing in infrastructure, investing in skills and reforming regulation. Mr. Speaker. They are the key items in the government's strategy to lift the productivity performance in the Australian economy that has been inadequate for a number of years. And central to this, Mr Speaker, has been the investment in infrastructure that forms part of the stimulus package that the government has put forward for the Australian people to boost economic activity. Now, Mr Speaker, the opposition doesn't accept that investment in infrastructure is crucial. It's happy to turn up to photo opportunities. It is happy to participate in local photo opportunities. It is happy to be part of the picture in the local paper, Mr Speaker, but the opposition does not, is not prepared to support infrastructure investment when it comes to voting in this chamber, Mr Speaker. The, this particular aspect, Mr Speaker, has always puzzled me. It has always puzzled order, me somewhat, Mr order, Speaker. Order. Order. The House will come to order and not be distracted by events it, in the gallery. Thank you the very much, Mr Minister Speaker. Of Finance. It has always puzzled me somewhat, Mr Speaker, as to why the opposition is not prepared to support nation-building infrastructure. And indeed, it puzzled me for nearly 12 years when they were in government as to why they were not prepared to invest in infrastructure for Australia's future. It's always puzzled me. Now, given the astonishingly juvenile performance we've just witnessed from the opposition, perhaps I shouldn't be that puzzled. But I can tell you this, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, yesterday, I got a little bit of a hint, a little bit of a clue as to why the opposition doesn't support investing in infrastructure. Because in Senate estimates hearings yesterday, the Shadow Minister for Finance, Senator Coonan, asked a question of public servants. The question she asked was this, and I quote. What is infrastructure? Order. What is infrastructure? That was her question, and she then followed up with the question: the What is your North definition Sydney. of infrastructure? So, Mr. The Speaker, the problem Sydney. the opposition has is they don't even know what infrastructure is. That's why they don't support it, Mr. Speaker. That's why they don't support it. The government is committed to investing in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. It is committed to lifting the productivity performance of the Australian economy, which for too many years languished under the now opposition. For too many years they did not invest in infrastructure and skills. They did not seek to reform Australia's regulatory structures. Order. And as a Order. result, the, as a result the Australian productivity performance languished, Mr Speaker. The Australian government knows.
the importance of investing in infrastructure. Australian business knows the importance of investing in infrastructure, and indeed the wider community knows the importance of investing in infrastructure. Senator Coonan, who I remind you was not a minister for a portfolio with nothing to do with infrastructure, she was the minister responsible for broadband. The minister responsible for broadband has to ask, what does infrastructure mean? That gives you some indication, Mr. Speaker, of the true depths of ignorance and complacency and lack of regard for the long-term productivity development of this nation that the Liberal Party opposition represents, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Australian government, the Rudd government, has a very different perspective. We regard invest investment in productive infrastructure as central to the economic future of this nation. In Member broadband, in ports, in road, in rail and in skills, they are the central drivers of long-term prosperity for the Australian people. The member for Casey. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Has the government received advice from the Treasury detailing scenarios in which government debt could blow out further than the Treasurer has forecast? The Treasurer. Mr Speaker, the advice the government has received from the Treasury is the advice that's conveyed in the budget papers. Yeah. The, chief opposite, the Chief Government Whip. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My Order. question, Mr Speaker, Order. is to the Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Will the Minister outline how the government's nation-building economic stimulus plan is supporting green-collar jobs and reducing cost-of-living pressures to households? The Minister for Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Chifley for that question. And I note that we already have some 140 households in his electorate who have applied for either the insulation rebate or the solar hot water rebate under the Rudd government's plans. And the member's constituents join over 50,000 Australian households who have already accessed the Energy Efficient Homes Plan part of the $42 billion nation-building economic stimulus plan. And I also note Mr. Speaker, that the member for Chifley's electorate is home to the Fletcher insulation plant in Rudy Hill, where the insulation production is going through the roof. And that is what the economic stimulus package is about. It's about making sure that we have jobs, jobs that are created in the local community and, at the same time, rolling out the largest ever energy efficiency program that Australia has ever seen. And Mr Speaker, this package from this government will deliver energy efficiency to around three million Australian households over the next three years. This is an ambition well beyond any previous energy efficiency program in this country, and it's a mark of the Rudd government's commitment to getting on with the business of supporting jobs that we're seeing this program deliver so quickly right across the nation. Now, Mr. Speaker, I saw some comments earlier this week from the US Secretary of Energy, Dr. Stephen Chu, and he said, and I quote, the quickest and easiest way to reduce our carbon footprint is through energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is just not low-hanging fruit. It is fruit that's lying on the ground. And Mr. Speaker, the government couldn't agree more. And it's well overdue that we began to harvest that low-hanging fruit because the previous government were asleep at the wheel for too long on this issue. And I can report to the House that the Energy Efficient Homes Call Centre has already received more than 83,000 calls over the same period. So since February, 83,000 calls, 27,000 Australians looking to install ceiling insulation and 23,000 Australians looking to install solar hot water. And Mr Speaker, this is all before the rollout of components. The full rollout starts on the 1st of July. And Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I'll come to Order. you later on. I'll come to the member of Flinders later on. Order. I'm glad he's made that Order. intervention because I'll come to him later on. Order. Mr. Speaker, Order. I the Bradford the insulation group, to ignore the member for Flinders and the member for the Flinders to stop interjecting. The Bradford insulation group have informed my office that they are adding employees on the manufacturing side alone by some 55 people. That doesn't include additional jobs from call centres and warehousing. And just last week as well, Fletcher Insulation announced an $8 million upgrade to its Victorian manufacturing plant and the extension of its Dandenong and Rooty Hill plants 
to 24-7 production. And that's the Rudy Hill plant in Chifley, where I understand that prior to the energy efficient homes package, there was some consideration of rationalising operations. Now they're going 24-7. And Mr Speaker, Fletcher Insulation has also announced the creation of 50 jobs as a result of this increased demand. Now, Mr Speaker, what are these jobs about? With Fletcher Insulation, these jobs are about pink bats. But it's not just about pink bats, of course. It's about green bats. It's about polyester. It's about glass wool. It's about rock wool. It's about cellulose. It's about natural wool. It's about foil. If it meets the standards, you can install it under the Energy Efficient Homes Plan. But of course, pink bats is the product that is so often maligned by the member for North Sydney, the shadow treasurer, who takes every opportunity to ridicule an investment that's already supporting Australian jobs and saving Australians' energy bills. We wouldn't have had the pink bats, the member for North Sydney says, and he goes out of his way to run down the most cost-effective, energy-efficient improvement that Australians can actually apply at this time, and it's one that produces jobs. Now, Mr Speaker, the opposition leader is fond of getting up in the House and saying it's all about jobs, jobs, jobs. But I saw a weekend report in the Sydney Morning Herald pointing out that when he was Environment Minister, he actually wanted to roll out a program of sealing insulation around Australia, as is this government doing. But he was blocked by the member for Higgins, just as he's been blocked by the Nationals on an emissions trading scheme. And I think this says a lot about where the opposition's at, Mr Speaker, because they're voting against measures and publicly ridiculing measures. And some of these member were the same Dixon. measures that they wanted to introduce when they were in government, but in the case of the opposition member leader, Dixon. he wasn't able to. Now, Mr Speaker, the government is delivering, providing leadership on an issue that produces green collar jobs, which produces the largest ever energy efficiency program that's been rolled out into this country, that supports and assists Australians <laughs> in reducing their energy bills and taking care of cost of living pressures, providing real leadership in the infrastructure of this country and helping people reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. The member for Casey. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And my question is again to the Treasurer. And I refer the Treasurer to his last answer, in which he referred to the budget papers. And I ask him, has the government received additional and separate advice from the Treasury detailing scenarios in which government debt could blow out further than what the Treasurer has forecast? The Treasurer. Well, what we've got here, Mr Speaker, is another smokescreen from those opposite to try and camouflage the fact that they don't have an alternative fiscal policy. He well knows that uh, net debt is projected to fall to 3.7 per cent of GDP by 2019-20, Mr Speaker. But what this is all about is to cover up for their embarrassment for not having an alternative fiscal policy and not being able to articulate anything about Member this, for either in this House or outside. Has the Treasurer concluded? No. The member for Casey on a point of order. On a point of order, Mr Speaker, the question was very specific as to whether he had received additional and specific advice. The Treasurer. Mr Speaker, on, on the doors yesterday we got a real insight into the predicament of those opposite. We had the member for Bowman out there doing an interview. And this is what he said order. in order. answer to this question from a journalist. What level of debt is not too high? Lamy. There is no level of debt that is too high or not too high. <laughs> journalist, journalist, what do you Order. regard the as an acceptable level his of seat. debt? The Treasurer resume his seat. The Treasurer resume his seat. Treasurer. Treasurer. The Order the member for Bowman. Well, I simply say to the member for Canning, it doesn't really justify the member for Bowman denying the manager of opposition business the call, which is the amazing point. The manager of opposition business. Mr Speaker, under the standing orders, uh, relevance is required, and he was asked a specific question about advice. If he doesn't wish to answer the Order question, the I think we know what the real answer is. Seat. And he should... The manager of opposition business resume his seat. The Treasurer will relate his response to the question and he will refer to members by their titles. The Treasurer. Well, certainly, Mr Speaker, well, I was asked about debt and I'm talking about debt. Absolutely, Mr Speaker. Order. This is what the member for Bowman had to say this morning when asked by a journalist 
What do you regard as an acceptable level of debt? The member for Bowman, I won't name a number. Journalist, give us a number. Member for Bowman, no numbers, no numbers. Order, no. The member for Dixon resume his seat. The member, the treasurer, treasurer will respond to the question. Treasurer. And Mr. Speaker, as order, hopeless order. as that sounds, order. it was then taken up by another order. member of the opposition order. this morning. It was taken up, in fact, by the leader order, the of the opposition. For, no, the member this for Dixon. I am listening to the. Morning. If there was less interjecting, I would be able to listen to the. Treasurer. The Treasurer has the call. The Treasurer will respond to the question. Order. Treasurer. Mr Speaker, this was what the Leader of the Opposition was asked this morning. What does the Coalition regard as an acceptable level of debt? Leader of the Opposition. Order. The Treasurer will resume his seat. Order the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On a point of order, the Treasurer is defying you. You have directed him to answer the question, and he is defying you. The member for Leichhardt. Member for Leichhardt. Treasurer will respond to the question and relate his material to the question. The Treasurer. Well, yeah, Mr. Speaker, I'm talking about debt, and I'm talking about the leader of the opposition this morning when he was asked, "What does the coalition regard as an acceptable level of debt?" Leader of the opposition. Well, the level of debt should be no more than is absolutely necessary. Journalists, what Order. then? Leader of the opposition. Order. Well, it's not a question the of a number. The Treasurer will resume his seat. Not Treasurer. Treasurer. Treasurer will resume his seat. Member for Leichhardt. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Science and Personnel. Will the Minister update the House on the progress of Defence Housing Australia in constructing the 802 houses funded under the Nation Building Economic Stimulus Plan? The Minister for Defence, Science and Personnel. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I thank the member for Leichhardt for his question uh, and thank him for joining me in his electorate on the 19th of May when we launched the defence health care trial in Cairns. Uh, he's a strong supporter of defence, the defence community, and he was with me as we delivered on another election promise from the Rudd government. I note also for the uh, member for Leichhardt that under the Australian Government's Nation Building for Recovery program, there are 236 projects in his electorate, projects supporting jobs and small businesses in suburbs such as Waree and Redlich. And as we know, uh, Mr Speaker, this is part of the Government's program of Nation Building for Recovery, supporting jobs and business for in and infrastructure uh, for Australia's needs for tomorrow. Of course, we know if the Liberals had their way, not one single one of these projects would commence. You'll be aware also, Mr Speaker, uh, that as part of this nation-building program, uh, the government's decisive action, as part of the government's decisive action, we announced expenditure of $251.6 million in funding for Defence Housing Australia. This is to construct 802 dwellings for Australian Defence Force personnel and their families in metropolitan and regional centres. I'm pleased to be able to announce that DHA have had significant, uh, had significant progress since this announcement. Nationwide, over 260 houses have been contracted to date. Tenders for over 650 houses have been issued. Major site works have begun on over 180 houses. Unfortunately, though, as ever, as ever, Mr. Speaker, the opposition has not supported this measure. The following members are significant. The member for Herbert. 
the member for Hunter, the member for Mayo, the member for Gilmore, the member for Grew, the member for Indi, the member for Flinders and the member for Gippsland all voted against having Defence Force families have new homes built Order. in their electorate. Order. The minister resumed his seat. The minister resumed his seat. The, the, uh, I, the member for Patterson, I think, is going to. It's not quite a point of order, but you're making a point very quickly. Uh, order. 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 May I, uh, Mr. Speaker, I wouldn't have called the member of Hunter not yeah, supporter I, of defence I housing. I understand. Australia. I think he should member for, his member own for minister. Patterson will resume his seat. The, mini the minister has the call. Of minister. Course, order. Of course, Mr. Speaker. Order. Of course, Mr. Speaker. Order. Of course, Mr. Minister Speaker. Has the call. I meant Patterson's curse, not the member for Hunter. Order. 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 Mr. Yeah, the minister, member for Patterson, resume his seat. The minister has the call. Now, Order. Now, sadly, no, sadly, uh, Mr. Speaker. Order. No, the minister, resume. Well, resume his seat until the house comes to order. <laughs> the minister for defence, science, and personnel. Fortunately and sadly, Mr. Speaker, while these members say they advocate for Defence Force families, they failed miserably when it came to the opportunity to show their support by voting for this investment in this chamber. No doubt, Mr. Speaker, as we've known, they'll be shameless in attending any ceremonies celebrating the handover of the new homes. Of course, uh, Mr. Speaker, we expect them to carry placards. Those placards should say, we're here in body, but not in spirit, because, uh, because unlike the members of the Labor Party who have Defence Force families in their electorate, this provision of this additional housing for Defence Force families and the job and business opportunities it creates, we do not support. That is what they have done by voting against these proposals in this chamber. <coughs> Yet I note that the member for, the member for Herbert got up earlier this afternoon and spoke about the need for people to stand up for regional Australia. Well, I asked the member for Herbert, when's he going to stand up for the people of regional oh, Australia? When's he going to stand up for oh, the people of his electorate? Member for the Herbert fact that he voted seat. against the Mr. Member Speaker. for Herbert, resume his seat. Minister has the call. The, the minister has the call. Member for Herbert, no, the member for Herbert, resume his The member for Herbert has other... The member for Herbert has other ways of dealing with what the matter that's and causing. All right, the minister for Jeremy's seat. The member for Herbert on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, when is the minister going to de uh, deliver the family order? Medical the member for will resume his seat and then leave for one hour under 94A. The map order. Apologise to Order. Order. Those on my left will come to order. The member for line. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, in light of the continued flood and wind recovery efforts underway on the mid-north coast and north coast of New South Wales across four electorates, and in light of this being the third natural disaster in three months of this kind, in light of ongoing regional impacts of the global banking collapse felt on the ground through such examples as one local council now writing off $25 million of its investment portfolio and up to 5,000 local residents being caught by the recent collapse of three locally managed funds, in light of unemployment for the Richmond Tweed Mid North Coast now breaking 10 per cent last month, in light of employment rates and participation rates being the lowest in the, in the nation right now, income levels being the lowest in the nation right now, tertiary education levels being some of the lowest in the nation right now, 
and in light of poverty across these four electorates being some of the highest in the nation right now. Prime Minister, in light of natural disasters, financial disasters and ongoing structural disadvantage for the Mid-North Coast and North Coast regions, we now look to increase government support and attention to our region along the lines of the seven Australia-wide jobs funds regions recently announced by your government. government. The Prime Minister. Um, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for his question. Um, he legitimately points to the difficulties which have been experienced uh, recently in um, the um, Richmond, Tweed, Clarence Valley, the Mid-North Coast uh, on the back of natural disasters, but also more broadly in the impact of the uh, global economic recession on the communities, on the communities which he represents. And therefore, he legitimately raises questions of what can be further done in his area. I was um, speaking with the um, Minister for Employment Participation about the, ministers, uh, the members' area recently as we looked at unemployment data from across the country. And uh, the member uh, represents an area which, from recollection, uh, looking at the data from April, is north of 8 per cent, 8.3, per cent. Uh, and therefore, in terms of those priority areas which the government is seeking to address additional efforts to at the moment, it uh, would therefore, uh, from our point of view, uh, qualify for further consideration by way of additional assistance. Uh, therefore, uh, my discussions with the uh, Minister for Employment Participation, uh, we've agreed that uh, this should be designated as a priority employment area, and that is the area of um, the Richmond, Tweed, Clarence Valley, the North Coast. Um, we would also confirm to the honourable member in response to his question that we will proceed with the appointment uh, of uh, a priority employment coordinator for this area as well. Uh, the particular mechanism uh, that uh, the priority employment coordinators are deploying uh, across the nation is to engage with local communities, their business leadership, their community leadership, their local government leadership and local church and charitable organisations and work together to come up with practical <coughs> projects which could form the basis for further investment from the Community Jobs Fund. Uh, which is a fund which we provided uh, support for in earlier allocations from this parliament nationwide of some $650 million. Uh, in response to the announcement of that fund, we also uh, made it clear in statements from the government that in our jobs and training compact with Australia, uh, we would be implementing compacts with young Australians, compact with those Australians who have been retrenched through no fault of their own, and compacts uh, also with local communities. This particular program comes off the back of compacts with local communities. In the seven areas that we currently have designated around the country, uh, we uh, have uh, already, together with the Minister for Employment Participation, uh, addressed local community seminars about practical projects which could be supported. And further, in conversations with the Minister recently, I understand that in, t in response to the first round uh, seeking applications from the community at large, that we received more than 3,000 applications—I'm looking for a prompt from the minister here—3,000 plus uh, applications from around the country. Um, therefore, uh, there will be further rounds uh, which will be uh, sought uh, for expressions of interest from local communities. I would invite the honourable member and other affected local members uh, in this region uh, to work with the priority employment coordinator once they are appointed in terms of working on particular projects which will have effect in their area. Uh, Mr Speaker, what I would say more broadly about the challenge of unemployment uh, is that as the global recession has deepened and the recession uh, has um, inflicted uh, damage on the Australian economy and on the workforce more generally, it underlines again the absolute importance of a nation-building uh, for recovery program of the type which the government has outlined in this parliament over the last two weeks and prior to that as well. That provides an additional injection of activity in the economy. Again, I emphasise something which the Treasurer correctly put to the House before, which is in the absence of the government action to date through, firstly, our stimulus payments uh, in uh, October last year, secondly, the Nation Building and Jobs Plan, which was released in February this year, and thirdly, the measures contained in the budget, that on the back of those investments, so we are providing support for 200,000 plus jobs in the Australian economy for each of the two subsequent years, which would otherwise be lost. That is a huge number in the overall dimensions of the size of the Australian workforce. And therefore, what we've sought to do on top of that in particular areas of intense uh, unemployment uh, activity uh, is to provide additional support through the application of local jobs funds. I therefore thank the honourable member for his question. Uh, he, together with the uh, member for Page, the member for New England, um, and the, mem sorry, the member for New England, the member for Page, the member for Richmond, 
um, uh, in terms of the uh, particular area that we're speaking of, uh, Page, uh, Richmond, uh, Lyme, uh, and other affected areas, I'd encourage them to work closely uh, with the uh, local employment coordinator, get applications in for what will work locally to try and bring that unemployment rate down a further notch compared with what it would otherwise be, building on the back of the Nation Building for Recovery Plan that the government has outlined comprehensively in the parliament. The member for Wakefield. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. What action is the government taking to, to improve the health of rivers and wetlands in the Murray-Darling Basin? The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I thank the honourable member for Wakefield uh, for, his, uh, his answer, for his question, because it goes to the whole health of the Murray-Darling uh, River system, and it goes to what uh, investments we are making in that system for the future in order to deal with the fact that water allocations across the Murray-Darling have been excessive not just for years but for decades. And the challenge for, on the part of any responsible government of Australia is what action that you can take to take some of that pressure off the system. Uh, can I say in response to the honourable member's question that all honourable members in this House should ask themselves one question. How many litres of water entitlements did the previous government buy back in their 12 years in office? Zero. Twelve years of rhetoric on the Murray-Darling, twelve years of rhetoric on taking pressure off the system, not one gigalitre, not one litre of water entitlements was ever purchased back from the system in order to take the pressure off the Murray-Darling. That is the record of those opposite, and I seem to recall that Leader of the Opposition at a certain stage of his political career was also the minister responsible for water. Again, parallel to what we've seen on climate change, a lot of statements of rhetoric at an earlier time, but when the rubber hits the road and you're required to do something and actually deliver an outcome, be it on climate change, be it on the carbon pollution reduction scheme, be it having occupied a ministerial position able to purchase back entitlements from the river system, not one litre of water entitlements ever purchased back. Mr Speaker, this government is a government of action. This government has committed uh, to assist in taking pressure off the system. And I would like to confirm to the House today that the Australian government is buying almost 240 gigalitres of water entitlements for $303 million from the Twynham Agricultural Group. Mr Speaker, this represents the single largest purchase of water from the environment in Australia's history. The single largest purchase of water entitlements for the environment in Australia's history. That is what we have done in this decision today announced by myself and the Minister Order. for Climate Change and Water. Once again, once again we hear the barracking answered. from the National Party, the National Party who actually call the shots within the coalition on water policy and climate change. When it ever, yeah, it's, it's the tail wagging the dog once again. The National Party says, we're not going to do anything on climate change. What does Malcolm Turnbull do? Collapse in a heap. What does the National Party say on buying back water entitlements? We're not going to do anything on that. Malcolm Turnbull collapses Order in the, the heat. The Prime Minister will refer to members by their titles. The <laughs> member for Mayo. I just wonder if the Prime Minister can tell the House how much, will re how much of this water Order will reach Wakefield. Order the member for Mayo. Pro Prime Minister has a call. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's always a delight to hear uh, from the um, former member for Mayo's replacement in this place. Mr. Speaker, what we have is a clear indication of government action. 240 gigalitres purchased for $303 million. If you add that to what we have also, what we have also purchased back, this government has purchased 300 gigalitres of water entitlements to take pressure off the system. And I would say to those, I would say to those opposite, as um, again the member for Flinders seeks to intervene, again a stellar parliamentary career of great achievement when it comes to delivering real results. Nothing. Uh, this government has acted to buy back water entitlements of two, nearly 300 gigalitres, contrasted to not a single litre of water entitlements purchased back in their 12 years in office. Why? Because it's the National Party that controls the coalition on this. The National Party dictates the shots. Any leader worth his salt would stand up to the National Party. The current leader does not. 
This investment is part of the government's $12.9 billion Water for the Future program. And under this Water for the Future program, it provides $3.1 billion for purchase of water for environmental purposes. And also, our water purchasing program is complemented by a $5.8 billion program for infrastructure investment to improve water use efficiency. Mr. Speaker, well, the these are practical decisions to member take pressure Flinders. off the system. And for the benefit of those opposite, let me just say what it actually amounts to in terms of 240 gigalitres of water. That is equivalent to one half of all the water used in Sydney in a year. One half of all the water used in Sydney in a year. And I heard the Minister for Climate Change say this morning it is in excess of what the City of Adelaide itself takes off the Murray Darling system the each year. In itself. These are not small numbers, these are large numbers. Because this government takes seriously oh, the leader of the National Party intervening again. How many litres, how many gigalitres of entitlements would the National Party have as buyback? Can't hear anything. Once again, what we have is the National Party parading itself in this place as the tail that wags the dog in the coalition, both on climate change policy and on water policy. Mr. Speaker, can I just say in this place, when we're debating serious questions of climate change and its most direct impact, which is what's happening to the once great Murray Darling River system, what's happening to the Great Barrier Reef, what is happening also to Kakadu, that what we need in this parliament is leadership. What we need is leadership from the Liberal Party on water, on climate change, so that we can make a difference in the Senate. What we have is a leader of the opposition who has, on these hard questions of policy, squibbed it in the face of the right-wing ideologues within his own party and within the National Party more broadly. As a consequence, they stand ready in the Senate to vote down, to vote down measures on climate change that would make a difference. This government is about making a difference on climate change in water. Those opposite are simply captive to the National Party and the climate change sceptics within, within their own ranks. Mr. Speaker, we have a plan Order. of action for the Murray-Darling. Those opposite have nothing but a litany of excuses for inaction on the Murray-Darling. The contrast is clear for all to see. The Leader of the Nationals. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer, and I refer the Treasurer to the fact that it was confirmed in Senate estimates this week that there is only $2.4 billion of funds available for the national broadband network, and that the government will have to borrow more than $40 billion for this project. Treasurer, why haven't those numbers been included in your debt forecasts? The Treasurer. Because you just made them up. What, what we have included in there is provision for an equity injection. That's what we've done. And what we've also done is acknowledge that if we move forward and we do more, we may have to guarantee borrowings, Order. and that is accounted for in the statement of risk. The member for Shortland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister Order. for Health and Ageing. Order. The House will come to order. The member for Shortland has the call. The member for Shortland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Will the Minister update the House on the latest swine flu developments and any steps the government has taken to protect the community from the disease? The Minister for Health and Ageing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Shortland for her question. She's always interested in steps that can be taken to protect the community. Uh, obviously, the Prime Minister and I went through a number of steps that the government has already taken uh, to tackle this problem yesterday in question time, but there are some further developments today that I'd like to keep the House abreast of. Uh, but before I do that, just to advise that we now have 103 confirmed swine flu cases in Australia. The number has jumped significantly overnight. Uh, in the course of that time, we have also seen the number increase, for example, in the United States by 1,000 new cases uh, and in Canada by an additional 200 cases. So the disease has got to a point where the numbers are increasing fairly significantly around the country, and we can expect, unfortunately, to see more of that uh, in the coming days. Uh, I'd like to advise the House that there is a Significant Order. change. Minister. 
I, there is a significant change to a number of circumstances that members might need to be aware of. Whilst most of the 103 people who have been confirmed as having swine flu have been experiencing mild symptoms, we do now have four people who have been hospitalised, uh, two in Victoria who presented with quite severe um, condition. Both are now recovering well. Uh, one young man in New South Wales whose condition is improving and one case where we still don't have confirmed details uh, as there seem to be some other unrelated complications with that person's circumstances. Uh, there's also been a lot of focus, of course, on the situation of the Pacific Dawn, the cruise ship that has been uh, up in northern Queensland. I can advise, um, in addition to the comments that I've made earlier, that the Queensland government and P&O have now um, announced that an agreement has been reached for the ship to um, dock in Brisbane on Saturday and return to Sydney on Monday, three days early. Um, this agreement has been reached in order to uh, ensure that passengers can spend still some of their time uh, having their holiday safely on the boat, um, can get the support if any is required at these two major ports. Uh, three crew members have tested positive to swine flu. They have all been receiving Tamiflu from the commencement of the trip uh, and don't uh, believe, as I've been advised, that they have been in contact with other passengers. No passengers have currently tested positive to swine flu, um, and P&O does advise that passengers will be compensated for the shortening of their trip. We obviously uh, thank P&O for their cooperative actions and, of course, want to join in apologising to passengers um, whose holidays might have been disrupted, but I think the public health advice to ensure that this disease, which is uh, not yet in northern Queensland, uh, can be, as, for as long as possible, isolated from parts of the community that don't have any cases. Um, the government's taken an important step to further protect the community today, and that is we've placed an order with CSL for the purchase of the swine flu vaccine. This vaccine is expected to be developed in the next couple of months. We have a priority agreement with CSL, which has been activated, and this means that we will be placed in the queue, high in the queue, to be able to receive this vaccine once it's able to be produced by CSL. We've placed an order for um, doses to be purchased sufficient for 10 million people. That's based on the current expert advice that this is sufficient to contain the spread of the disease, but also pr to protect those at risk of any complications. Of course, further work will continue to be done while the vaccine is being developed as we have any further evidence in Australia of particular groups that might be more vulnerable. Um, CSL is obviously currently working fast to develop the vaccine. It will need to do clinical trials. It will register um, with the TGA to ensure that the vaccine is safe. We also, in the past fortnight, purchased an additional 1.6 million courses of Relenza for the stockpile. Um, which means that we are building on our existing supply in the stockpile. We will have um, 6.9 million courses of Tamiflu, 1.8 million courses of Relenza and the additional purchases that I've just announced, meaning that we will have 10.3 million courses of antivirals in our stockpile. I also need to advise that the first requests and release of Tamiflu, the first requests have been made from the states and territories, and the first release of Tamiflu from the national medical stockpile have commenced. Uh, the chief medical officer authorised the release of seven and a half thousand doses of paediatric Tamiflu suspension for Victoria and Western Australia, and 10,000 packets of Tamiflu to Victoria. This is of particular importance because the paediatric version, of course needs to be used particularly for very young children uh, in Victoria. That's in order to ensure where we're seeing the disease spreading more quickly than other communities that they'll have sufficient supply. And I understand that Western Australia did not have a large supply of paediatric Tamiflu, and although they only have one case confirmed, wanted to make sure that they had some on hand if the situation develops. Um, we, of course, will continue to consider requests as they come in. We've already taken steps to ensure that um, the stockpile is not being held just in Canberra, so it can be readily made available to uh, state and territory authorities if and when they need them. And the chief medical officer, of course, will take account of the different circumstances in different parts of the country in uh, making a decision whether the stockpile should be used, and will look at the number of cases, the spread, the epidemiological advice, and of course the availability of medicines in the states and territories. These medicines will be dispensed by state public health officials 
in line with agreed national guidelines. And, um, I think it is important to remember that this means Australia is very well placed to handle this situation. The community does need to be prepared that there will be an increased number of cases, probably significantly, in the coming few days, and any support that members can continue to give to the public to remember that there is no need to be alarmed, but there certainly is need to be vigilant and ensure that people— Order. It is important to remain vigilant and to provide advice to people to see their medical professional uh, if they are experiencing any flu symptoms and if they particularly have travelled to countries at risk or believe they have been in contact with any confirmed cases. The member for Flinders. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Environment, Heritage and the Arts. And it concerns his declaration during question time on 12 May in relation to logging activities in New South Wales' central Murray forests, when he stated, and I quote, it is particularly important for me to confirm that no stop work order has been issued by the department. Is the minister aware of this letter from the assistant secretary of his department dated 1 May 2009 to New South Wales State Forests, clearly stating that by 31 May there must be, and again I quote, cessation of all harvesting operations in the Central Murray State Forests Ramsar site until further advice from this department. Can the minister explain the inconsistency between his statement and his department's actions? The Minister for Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Uh, thank Order. You. Order. <coughs> the Minister you. has been asked a question. The Minister is now getting the opportunity to respond. So. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the Honourable Member for his question. And it astonishes me that the Honourable Member hasn't been following uh, this debate more closely since that article was first uh, produced and, in fact, since that correspondence was first issued, because what we have said, uh, and this is uh, the case, that we will continue negotiations with the New South Wales government on those matters that have been identified in that correspondence. And I'm happy to report to the House that those negotiations are ongoing. I also want to make perfectly clear to the honourable member opposite Order. The that no stop order has been issued. This is correspondence. This is correspondence, Mr. Speaker, between the department to uh, the New South Wales government, and on that basis, negotiations are underway between those two governments. Order. The member for Brisbane, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. How has the Australian government been working to increase Australia's engagement with international regional organisations? The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for his uh, question. Uh, Mr Speaker, since coming to office, the government has been working very hard to increase Australia's engagement across a range of uh, countries and a range of regions. Regrettably, when we came to office, we discovered that there were many parts of the globe, many regions where there had been considerable inattention so far as Australian foreign policy and activity had been concerned. Uh, that's why, uh, Mr Speaker, for example, we've moved very quickly to establish uh, observer Member status with the own. South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, a very important uh, South Asian regional group, which of course includes India and uh, Pakistan. It's why, Mr Speaker, I attended the African Union Summit in January of this year, the first Australian Foreign Minister to uh, do so. Opposition. It's why, Mr Speaker, before the end of this year, we'll start our strategic dialogue with the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC, across a range of uh, trade, strategic <coughs> and security matters. And it's why, Mr Speaker, last year we established a modern framework for the basis of the relationship between Australia and the European Union with the presentation of the Australia-European Union partnership framework. Mr Speaker, I'm very pleased to advise the House today that Australia has taken additional steps to deepen our engagement with both Europe and Asia. The Asia-Europe meeting process, or ASEM as it is known, brings together 16 Asian nations and the ASEAN Secretariat, along with uh, 27 European Union nations and the European Commission. 
ASEM was inaugurated at, with the first ASEM Leaders Summit in Bangkok in March 1996. Australia, some members will recall, applied for membership in 1996 but was unsuccessful, applied for membership again in 1998 at that Leaders Summit but was unsuccessful, and regrettably, Mr Speaker, no further efforts were made since 1998 for a decade to get Australia into that important regional, important regional organisation, deepening and broadening our engagement with both Asia and Europe. Mr Speaker, after the government came to office at the first ASEM meeting in Beijing in 2008, the first ASEM meeting since the government came to office, Australia applied for membership of ASEM. The government put forward Australia's name. I'm very pleased to advise the House, Mr Speaker, that in Hanoi this week, Australia's application to join the Asia-Europe meeting process was welcomed by ASEM foreign ministers. And once arrangements have been effected to formalise the detail of Australia's membership, Australia will join ASEM at the next Leaders' Summit, ASEM 8, uh, in Brussels next year. And our participation in that process reflects the government's very strong commitment to deepen and broaden our engagement both in Asia uh, and in Europe. It also reflects uh, the modern basis of our relationship and engagement with uh, Europe, just, to, just as it does our strongest possible commitment to our friends and colleagues in Asia. Mr Speaker, membership of the Asia-Europe uh, meeting process will make our engagement with both regions uh, stronger. This is a very positive and very welcome development, and it is one, frankly, Mr Speaker, which has overcome a decade of inattention and inactivity a decade of inattention and inactivity which has not been in our national interest, uh, and uh, despite uh, that uh, lack of activity and interest over a 10-year period, our membership of ASEM uh, from next year at the ASEM Leaders' Summit in uh, Brussels will enable us to more appropriately and effectively advance our national interests both in Asia and in Europe. The member for Cook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister. I refer the Deputy Prime Minister to the fact that in 2005 she solicited more than 1,300 signatures for her petitions to oppose any reduction in Medicare funding for IVF, and she described such cuts as a cruel measure. Does the Deputy Prime Minister support her government's broken promise to cut the Medicare safety net funding for IVF? Order. The Order, order. The minister can only be asked questions within her public administration and portfolio. She, she, put, and I would rule that the question was out of order. The member for Cook on, a point of, on the point of order. Point of order, Mr Speaker. My question went to her as the Deputy Prime Minister. She was a member of expenditure review. She was a member of the executive government. These are her decisions. And I seek leave to table the order. petitions uh, referenced in Hansard uh, that are under her name and other members of the government. Is, is leave granted? Is, is, no, no. Is there any objection to leave being granted? Mr Speaker, leave is not granted. The question is clearly out of oh. order. You should have gone to the health minister. It's her responsibility. Order. Order. The member for Cook will resume his seat. The member for Cook will resume his seat. The member for Cook will resume his seat. The member for Oxley will resume his seat. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, on the point of order, uh, standing order 98C, uh, small Roman numeral I says, a minister can only be questioned on the following matters for which he or she is responsible or officially connected. Roman numeral I is public affairs. I would have thought that the Deputy Prime Minister who lodged a petition herself for with 1,300 signatures with respect to a matter of public affairs would be prepared to answer the question whether she stood by the contents of that petition. I think that we had um, examples of this surrounding the actions of parliamentary secretaries before they became bought. Order. 
we had instances. Oh, the member for Fadden will leave the chamber for one hour under 94A. I name the member for Fadden. Service of the House. The, sorry, the, yeah, the leader, of the, uh, the member, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and I apologise. I've been describing him as the member for Perth when referring to him as the acting leader of the House. Mr. The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud to be referred to as the member for Perth, and I move that the member be suspended from the service of the House. Right. The question is that the member be suspended from the service of the House. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Order. Lock the doors.
Question is, the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Shortland and Werriwa Tallis for the ayes and the members for Riverina and Ryan Tallis for the noes. Order. The result of the divisions is the result of the division is I seventy five, nose fifty nine. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The honourable member for Fadden is suspended for the services of the House for twenty four hours. The member for Oxley. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Will the minister inform the House on research into the impact of climate change and policy responses on our agricultural industries and whether there is any threat to action on climate change? The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Oxley for the question. The ABARE modelling is available now on the, both the costs of if we were to do nothing on climate change and the costs of action. And as members are well aware, there's no cost-free option in either direction. The modelling on Australian agriculture, if Australia were to do nothing, uh, was released uh, more than a year ago, which has export figures per commodity uh, which are alarming at the least. If we were to do nothing uh, in terms of wheat, our exports take an 11 per cent hit by 2030, a 15 per cent hit by 2050. On beef, a 29 per cent hit by 2030, a 33 per cent hit by 2050. Sheep meat, 15 per cent and 21 per cent. Dairy, 19 per cent hit by 2030, 27 per cent hit by 2050. And sugar, most alarming of all, our exports would take a 63 per cent hit by 2030 or a 79 per cent hit by 2050. That said, the cost of acting is not, is not free either, uh, and the costs are real and were referred uh, the other day to by ABARE in Senate estimates, and I do think it's important to advise the House uh, of those figures here. Uh, the costs at the point of processing, uh, which therefore includes the impact of on-farm inputs and the inputs by, by the time you get to processes, uh, would be in 2011 $1.83 per head of cattle, 17 cents per head of sheep. 61 cents per tonne of grain and $4 per head for the average dairy. These costs are real. They are small compared to the costs of not acting, but nonetheless there are significant costs in acting, which is why the government with the Climate Change Research Program has been determined that the scientific research in this space find the areas where we can get the alignment between improvements in productivity 
and the reduction in emissions, so that where each of those modellings pre presumed that there would not in fact be improvements in technology, the government, by more than tripling the money originally promised for the climate change research program, is determined to make sure that these issues can be aligned. The question also, though, asks what are the threats to responding? And of course, the threat in the government being able to respond through the carbon pollution reduction scheme lies very, very clearly in the behaviour as to what will happen from the coalition in the Senate. And some people, when the Leader of the Opposition became, first took on the role, were reasonably confident that we would end up with a, construct, a constructive approach and that we would not actually end up seeing a significant threat to action on climate change until this week came round. And this week, when it came round, if there was ever evidence that the Leader of the Opposition had become a threat to acting on climate change, it was before a word was spoken when he appeared side by side in the media conference with the Leader of the National Party. Now, it is, it is not unknown for a Leader of the Opposition to go searching for a power base when times are tough, to go to power brokers or to try to get a base of support. But the National Party? The National Party is a power base and base of support? This is a group of people. This is a group of people. This is a group of people who not only not only disagree fundamentally with the views that the leader of the opposition has always put on this issue, but can't even Order. agree with each other. Can't even agree with each other. Order. The member from Wide Bay that very day said we wanted to take a constructive approach to these issues, and yet the leader of the Nationals in the Senate, his his wording his wording of a constructive Order. approach was this. The answer is no. There you go. No, 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 no. OK. That's the unity. That's Order. the unity of the constructive member approach by Parks. the National Party. You have one member Blair, of sorry. the National Party who was reported on the 6th of August as saying he's prepared to out himself as a climate change sceptic to bring a voice of reason to the debate, and one member of the National Party in a media release only on Monday, oh, Monday order the member for Calair, the leader of the Nationals. as a massive threat. Now, order. And the concern order. as to the order. massive threat, as opposed to the climate change sceptic, is this. I was actually referring to order. the same member of the National Party. Order. The leader of the, the National Party. the same person, the shadow minister of immigration, the shadow minister for agriculture, who is both. Who the is member both for Calair. the climate change sceptic and Calair. the person who believes climate change is a massive the member threat. For the National Party will never, will never want to act on climate change, and the Leader of the Opposition at the moment has caved in entirely to the sceptics. At least there's an opportunity now, though, to show some leadership, because the opportunity for leadership is there, at least in terms of the local electorate, to stand up as requested at the end of question time and let us know whether or not you support school funding in your own electorate. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I ask that uh, further questions be placed on the notice paper.